So hello everyone. Today I'm going to be telling you about work on optimizing real-time data plane verification for multi-layer networks. This is joint work with Ardi Gupta from Princeton. So the need for highly reliable networks has never been greater than it is today. And one of the key technologies over the past 10 years that's really improved network reliability is data plane verification or the ability to exhaustively ensure the correctness of packet forwarding. Um, Oops. So starting in the research community, uh, data plane verification is now used uh, pervasively by many hyperscale cloud providers to ensure the safety of network operations. It spawned new startup companies that provide reliability as a service to smaller network operators. And at the heart of all of this uh, progress is work on fast verification engines. So some of the early work in network verification demonstrated that we could do verification of network data planes at scale efficiently. And later work then built on these foundations to show how verification could be performed incrementally. So the idea is that if there's a small change to the network state, you can recheck this in real time, like on the order of microseconds or milliseconds. And this lets you use these in a context where changes are constantly happening. So in this work, what we did is we uh, basically extended this prior work on real-time verification to uh, what we're calling layered networks in the tool we call Katra. So abstractly, I'm referring to a layered network as loosely being a network in which packets carry a stack of headers rather than just a single header. So layering in general is used pervasively in networks to implement many abstractions, for example, uh, with virtual networks offered by cloud providers, you have a virtual overlay built atop an underlying physical network. And then this is, abstraction is implemented using packet encapsulation. Similarly, with uh, traffic engineering or traffic steering systems, you may tunnel traffic to endpoint routers using a combination of technologies like IPGRE or MPLS. And even uh, with MPLS itself supports features like fast failover where packets can be dynamically rerouted around failed links by pushing new labels onto a label stack and then routing packets for that new top label. And there's many more examples of this with technologies like IP and IP, VXLAN, SD-WANs, IPSec, and more. However, while network layering is really common in practice, existing real-time verifiers were not designed to analyze layered networks. So to understand why it can be ineffective to analyze layered networks using existing verifiers today, let's look at how they actually work. Essentially, all data plane verifiers today verify the network forwarding behavior in three steps. So number one is they analyze a set of prioritized match action rules for each device in the network. These could be IP forwarding rules, they could be access control list rules or more. Second, they partition the high dimensional geometric space formed by packet fields into sets of equivalence classes. These are large sets of packets that have the same end to end forwarding behavior. For example, a packet with two fields, a port and a destination IP, can be viewed as forming a two-dimensional rectangle. Finally, they incrementally maintain an edge-labeled graph where each edge is annotated with the equivalence classes that would be forwarded over that edge. So at this point, you can check properties like reachability by just running graph algorithms like breadth-first search on this graph. When a new rule is added or an old rule is dele deleted from the network, you update the set of equivalence classes or add any new ones, find those that are changed, and then update the edge labeled graph and run any new checks that you need to. Uh, dealing with actions like modifying a field in a packet, decrementing a time to live field, or encapsulating a packet by adding a new outer header is a bit more involved, but the high level idea is that we require that packets in the same equivalence class must be transformed or modified to jump to the same set of target equivalence classes so that our graph algorithm can proceed. So for instance, modifying the, the equivalence class D in the figure may lead to new packets that straddle the space between C and B, and we need to add the new equivalence class E in the figure to make the transformation unambiguous. So going back to the problem of modeling layered networks with existing tools, a very naive way to do this would be to model the packet header as consisting of multiple copies of headers. So for instance, maybe if you have an IP and IP tunnel, you could use two IP headers to model that. However, there are a couple of problems with this uh, approach. So number one, even determining how many headers you need can be challenging in some cases. And so you may need to use a very conservative overestimate of that. 
So for example, with MPLS fast reroute, the number of labels pushed to the label stack may depend on the number of failures in the network at any given time, and you may not know that statically. Second, modeling multiple copies of these headers can lead to very expensive set operations that you need to maintain these equivalence classes. So many verifiers use complex data structures like binary decision diagrams to calculate the set of equivalence classes, and the cost of those operations grows with the number of headers or the number of bits. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, is that when you have duplicate headers, you're increasing the size of the state space being analyzed, and this can explode if you're not careful. And so I'll focus primarily on this third issue. So to see why this can be a problem, uh, let's consider some of the issues with the equivalence class-based approach to verification. So take as an example a simple packet modeled here with two fields. We have a destination IP field and we have a time to live field. And now because packets are dropped when the time to live reaches zero, you might think that initially there would be two equivalence classes in the network, one where the TTL is zero and one where it's greater than zero. However, to model the fact that the time to live gets decremented after forwarding a packet, we need to create a new equivalence class to ensure that the transformation is unambiguous. So for example, the packets with TTL1 must be separated from the rest of A because when they're decremented, they'll now fall in B space and the rest of A will stay in A. However, if you apply that reasoning recursively, you need to separate out the packets with TTL2 and so on. And this actually leads to a 256 times blow up in the number of equivalence classes. So going uh, back to layering, this problem is only compounded when you have multiple headers. So for example, suppose you wanted to model just a simple packet encapsulation for two IP headers, where you just copy the top header uh, when you encapsulate the packet. Now, the problem here is that if in the worst case, you can get a doubling of the number of equivalence classes for a single extra layer. And in general, for K layers, you can get two times K blow up in the number of equivalence classes. And these types of uh, transformations can uh, increase multiplicatively as well. So our key contribution with this work with Katra was surmounting this challenge and significantly speeding up real-time verification when you have complex transformations, particularly for networks with layering. And our key ideas are twofold. So number one is we basically get rid of this idea of full equivalence classes. And we introduce a new idea called partial equivalence classes, which are only required to have locally unambiguous forwarding rather than globally unambiguous forwarding. There are often way fewer of these partial equivalence classes than full equivalence classes, so we save a lot of work when doing new checks. Second, by leveraging the idea of partial equivalence, we can model only a single copy of the packet header and then delay the reasoning about layering until we absolutely have to do it. And I'll show an example of that in a minute. And our approach is general, so it integrates with existing verifiers, and we prove that our algorithm is correct and that it terminates. So the idea of partial equivalence classes is actually pretty uh, simple. So rather than requiring uh, that basically the packets have the same end-to-end -end forwarding behavior, they now only have to have the same local forwarding behavior. So for example, going back to our TTL example, where uh, we now only have two partial equivalence classes, one where the TTL is zero and one where it's greater than zero. Now let's say that all the packets with TTL greater than zero have the same next hop of B from A. Uh, we apply the decrement operation and we get a new set of, of TTL values which is now between zero and 254. And so again, that straddles the space between the two partial equivalence classes. But that's okay, we're just going to allow that to happen and we're gonna deal with it when we're doing the property checking. So let's take a look at how this works with an example. So here I have a network with three nodes, A, B, and C, and I've configured a tunnel between A and B. And let me just show how packets would be forwarded in this network. So suppose we have a packet with destination IP of 23.11.8.0 and a time to live value of 255. So this will match the second rule in the table at A, which encapsulates the packet by copying the top header and then rewriting the destination IP to the tunnel endpoint, which is 19.11.7.8. To model recursive routing, we set the next hop to be the same node A, and then we process that again at, at A, and the first rule now matches. This will forward the packet to node B before decrementing the time to live field of the outer header. At node B, a similar process will take place, so we're going to decapsulate the top header, and then the inner header will match the, node that, uh, the, the rule that forwards the packet to C, and then we decrement the, inner, the TTL of the inner header. So, even for this very simple network, it has nine rules in it. 
if you compute the set of equivalence classes for this, it's almost 1,800 of them. And the problem is partly because you're having to do this TTL unfolding, but also partly because you're keeping two copies of the destination, and so you have to account for combinations of values between the two. So our notion of partial equivalence is much more forgiving. Um, in this example, there's actually just four partial equivalence classes, or about 448 times fewer than full equivalence. And so the idea, again, if I look at uh, just a single one of these, like this 19.11.7 uh, slash 24 range, you can see that at every node, it has the same next top and the same action applied to it, even though transitively, uh, the, the packets may not stay in that class. So let's look at how we actually check properties like reachability now. It's a little bit more involved now because of this idea of partial equivalence. So suppose that there's an equivalence class that's changed uh, due to some rule update that the user makes. So we're going to start by um, basically with that partial equivalence class and we're gonna perform a kind of modified depth first search to explore the reachable set of packets. So at a high level our algorithm goes as follows. We first observe that because these packets are in the same partial equivalence class, they'll have the same forwarding behavior at node A, which means that they'll all go through the tunnel from A to B. Uh, at, at the end of this though, the outer uh, header may have a TTL that's either zero or greater than zero now. So rather than trying to uh, like worry about this ahead of time, what we're just gonna do is fork the execution of the DFS here. So we now have two cases, one where we have two headers in the header stack, where we're, we're capturing that with a stack of partial equivalence classes, and the TTL is zero in the outer header, and another where it's still greater than zero. There's another step where we may have to repair any inner headers in the stack um, because to account for this, this splitting operation. So for example, here we need to make a repair because the inner header must have initially had TTL one for this to now have TTL zero in the outer header. And we do the same on the left here. Uh, we do this again, so now we, we do a decapsulation operation and decrement the TTL of the inner header. And the result is the set of packets that are reachable from A to C. And the key idea here is that lazily expanding out these equivalence classes saved us a ton of work here uh, compared to pro, like preemptively computing all of these equivalence classes. And at the end of this, we still only have four partial uh, equivalence classes. So to summarize, the high level algorithm is now almost the same as before with other tools. We analyze the match action rules, identify any changed partial equivalence classes, and then run a modified DFS that analyzes the headers uh, and the header stacks to find property violations. In the paper, we prove that our algorithm is correct and that it terminates. And the latter is actually quite tricky because we don't bound the size of these stacks. So we have to appeal to um, ideas from pushdown automata to do that. In terms of expressiveness with Katra, we focus on a kind of property that we call a subpath closed property. This is a property where if the property holds on a, a path ending in a node, it holds on any subpath uh, ending at that same node. So for example, reachability, uh, loop freedom, non-reachability are all examples of uh, subpath closed properties. An example that's not a subpath closed property would be something like waypointing, where just because one node is waypointed through another node, it doesn't mean another node in that path, in this case U2, is also waypointed through that node. And what we show is that we can check subpath closed properties very efficiently because we can reuse states in this DFS uh, but we can also check other uh, properties that are not subpath closed, but it's um, significantly more expensive to do so. In terms of our evaluation, I'll just briefly summarize some of our results. Uh, we compared Katra against existing state-of-the-art verifiers on existing benchmarks for single layer networks. And unsurprisingly, we found that the performance is comparable to those tools. This is because those benchmarks don't have many transformations. Um, so the partial equivalence classes and the equivalence classes end up being almost identical. We then created another set of underlay and overlay benchmarks where we vary the size of the network and the number of layers and found that Katra was up to about 30 times faster, between five to 30 times faster than existing algorithms and that this advantage actually grows larger when the network gets bigger or the number of layers uh, grows. And then finally, Katra is fast. So even for four layers, we can verify 99.9% .9 of rules in well under one millisecond. So to summarize, data plane verification uh, improves network reliability. Data plane verifiers today are amazing. They're fast, they're incremental, but they weren't built with uh, layering in mind. 
And multi-layer networks are also pervasive. They're very common. They're in overlay networks, tunneling, label switching, and so on. So being able to handle those networks very efficiently is important. Uh, we introduced Katra, which extends incremental verifiers to multi-layer networks. And our new algorithm is based on partial equivalence and lazy header stack analysis. And we prove that our uh, algorithm is correct and that it terminates. So thank you for listening. Happy to uh, take any questions you might have now.